Well, uh, good to see a good turnout. I'm very pleased to welcome Paul Kelly here today, who's a lecturer on physical activity and health and a good friend of um, CEDA and the unit. And he's going to be talking for about 40 minutes on walking on sunshine, the evidence relationship between walking and mental health. So, um, Perfect. Thanks, James. Um, thanks to uh, James, Marco, and Justin for facilitating my trip down. Um, oh, lovely to be here in Cambridge and um, to, to, to be the seminar for, for the unit. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it quite informal, so please feel free to shout out questions or you know, we can start the discussion um, midway through. I'm going to aim for about 40 minutes and, and then any sort of questions and, and stuff like that at the end. Uh, like James says, I'm going to be talking about Walking on Sunshine, uh, which is a paper that we, we published this summer. Um, on walking and, and the, the effects it has on, on mental health. I've travelled down from Edinburgh, so I'm based at the University of Edinburgh. It's a lovely city. Please, uh, please come visit us if, if you're ever north of the border. Um, and I work in the Physical Activity for Health Research Centre, which I know at least two of you in the room know quite well. Um, we're led by Professor Lynette Moutry, and we have these kind of overarching goals for, for our centre. Uh, within that, um, I, I sort of do the research on specifically the health benefits of walking and cycling, um, how we measure physical activity, in particular walking and cycling, and then, and then pragmatic evaluation of, of physical activity interventions, most often walking and cycling ones, and I'm working with uh, James on an evaluation of the 20 mile an hour scheme, and, and Mike Kelly as well on, on uh, walking and cycling and collisions and accidents in Edinburgh and um, have done some work with Marco on modelling around air pollution and walking and things like that. PGSM uh, published a special edition on walking and health um, in the summer. Um, this uh, was, was, was the cover page, came out in June 2018. Um, and we had 10 articles in that special edition. Um, there's the infographic that I think all, Justin's going to make all the slides available. Um, so if, if you want to look any of these up. So, uh, Melody Ding um, from Sydney did some stuff around the neighbourhood environment and walking. Katrine Tudor Lock from America did some stuff on cadence and, and how they affect that as on health. Charlie Foster looked at um, mass media and community events, population promotions to promote physical activity, all sorts of things like that. Um, and I led the paper on walking and mental health benefits. And that's the one that I'm going to talk about today. The special edition was led by Professor uh, Marie Murphy from the um, University uh, of Ulster, um, and, and she sort of guided the process of, of the special edition. Now, Marie, uh, one of her mentors was, was Professor Adrian Harmon. And in 1997, Jeremy Morris, Professor Jeremy Morris and Adrian Harmon published this paper called uh, Walking to Health Clinic. Um, show of hands, anyone in the room familiar with this paper? quite an important paper in, in, in the walking literature, at least, physical activity um, piece. And um, in many ways, it marked a watershed in, in, in the amount of evidence we have on walking and health. So just a, a simple um, PubMed study of, 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 title, of studies that have walk uh, asterisks in the title. And you can see that um, Walking to Health was published in 1997, and there's a, a load more evidence now um, than there was back when, when um, Jerry Morris and, and Adrian Harmon reviewed the literature. Now, we're not saying that there's more evidence because of that paper, but it's certainly considered a, a seminal moment in, in, in the walking um, epidemiological and health evidence. Uh, this is the contents. It's the sort of stuff you'd expect. So um, physiology, endurance, bone strength, metabolism, um, cardiovascular disease, hazards, barriers, costs, air pollution, potholes. Um, but the section I'm going to talk about today is, is what they looked at in 1997 on mental health. And this is what they said. The pleasure, pleasurable and therapeutic psychological and social dimension of walking, whilst evident, have been surprisingly little studied. So that's what we knew about the link between walking and mental health in 1997. They also coined the phrase that um, you may have seen, you may have used, uh, that walking is the nearest activity to perfect exercise. Uh, so the rationale for the scoping review that we did this year, or this, this summer, was to see, based on that increase in, in evidence since 1997, what do we now know about the relationships and the associations between walking 
and mental health outcomes. I'm sure we, we could agree that there's a mental health burden both globally and in the UK. Um, I quite like this slide, um, mental health disorders, because it shows that they occur across the lifespan. So we aren't just talking about disease endpoints in, in later life. You know, mental health has a substantial burden um, both, both to society and to the healthcare services um, from basically from, from the day, day that you're born. So mental health is an important topic. Um, it gets a lot of media attention. You may have seen this headline um, over the summer. Um, BBC, I think it's one of their most read articles of 2018 related to health. It was based on the, the study that came out in Lancet Psychiatry, um, association between physical exercise and mental health, the largest ever um, association that was done. Um, and they found this kind of consistent U-shape um, between the amount or um, frequency or, or, or the number of times you exercised their words, not mine, and the number of days that people experienced mental health burden. So um, consistent kind of uh, finding there. Um, and then if we zoom in on walking, like, like you see there, the far more um, days of mental health burden if you don't do any walking exercise. And of course, quite interestingly, if you, if you do quite a lot. Now, it was a, it was a paper that garnered a lot of attention, um, both on social media and, and in the traditional media. It's also a paper that's been quite heavily critiqued. And, and criticised, and, and this is probably quite a good one to look at by um, Brendan Stubbs and colleagues, um, where they, they point out that physical exercise isn't quite consistent with the terms that we might use around physical activity, and that um, from cross-sectional data maybe you shouldn't infer that doing you know, lots and lots of exercise causes poor, poor mental health. So a, a very important paper in terms of the attention it garnered, but also one that showed that the evidence base remains um, with some limitations, and, and, and not one that we, we have really strong and consistent evidence, evidence for. <coughs> okay, so that's why mental health, um, but the other question is, well, why walking? So this is um, um, an analysis that uh, Dr. Tessa Strain produced um, 2017, 2016, a couple of years ago, yeah. um, using Scottish Health Survey data. So this is the activity profiles of people who meet physical activity recommendations in Scotland. Uh, males on the left hand side, females on the right, by 10 year bracket. And the different colours represent different types of physical activity. So I'm going to ask you to do just 30 seconds talking to the person next to you. What do you think the different colours represent? Off you go. <laughs> I should, I, should, I should point out that we, we didn't actually show this one, so this brown at the top, this is walking. Did you get walking? Did you get sport? Domestic? It's, the students normally like pointing out the amount of domestic that 16 and 4 year old males complete. Um, like I said, we, we take an occupational out of this one, it allows it, you to see slightly better some of the patterns and also occupational was quite poorly measured in, in the Scottish Health Survey at least. Um, some important stuff here, team sport, as you might expect, falls off quite dramatically with age. In Scotland, individual sport picks up in both men and women. We think that's a combination of golf and bowls. We think or do we know? It is, but it's um, because in Scotland, they get prompted to report them, whereas in England, they don't. So, so you play golf, potentially you play like golf. Um, But importantly, walking makes a consistent contribution to physical activity profiles 
in, in, in both males and females across the life course. So there's a really strong rationale for looking at walking um, in, in, in that respect. And when we look at the profiles of people who don't meet the activity guidelines, although they're much lower, we still see an important contribution from walking in, in the same way. So that's why walking, and that's why mental health as, as the topic of, of both the scoping review and, and today's talk. So this is the, the, the scoping review, um, and, and just a uh, note to my, the, the colleagues who, who helped reduce it. Uh, we found five existing reviews on the topic, and we found 55 eligible um, studies to be included. These were across eight mental health outcomes, which we, we pre-specified uh, based on the, um, the US guidelines report, the, the mental health outcomes that they use. Um, and our goal was to, to try and map the key knowns what do we know about the relationship now in 2018? What are the important sort of concepts and, and ideas in the literature? And what, where are the gaps? What are the research priorities are moving forward around walking and mental health? Show of hands, has anyone here ever done a scoping review? What, what did you think, Jenna? What were you expected? Uh, no, really. <laughs> Same. Um, it was a bit of a learning curve. I'd, I'd done a number of systematic reviews um, before this, and so well, that would be easy then, when it's just, it's just an easy version of a systematic, it's not. Um, quite difficult, the, the iterative nature make, makes it very fluid. Um, it was quite difficult to stay on top of what studies should be eligible and which ones, which ones were ineligible as, as the uh, priorities and the objectives evolved. It, it was really tempting to include the studies which said what I want, the point I wanted to make, and find a reason to exclude the ones that were inconvenient. So I did find the scope review quite a challenging um, learning curve. If you're ever thinking about doing one, the, the Arxia and O'Malley framework is a very helpful starting point. Um, that was incredibly uh, instructive in, in the method of, of doing the review. And just that, it, it didn't come out in time for us, but just out this, this month, there's um, an extension to the PRISMA uh, guidelines, which is specifically for scoping reviews, which um, I think it would be really helpful for, for the next one uh, we're working on. And, and, and James and I just attempted a sort of scope review for PHE and found some of, the, some of the same problems. Okay, so here are the results. This is what we found for the eight mental health outcomes. So for depression, there was systematic review level evidence, both for the preventive and for the treatment effects of walking. Um, so, if, if you like strong and consistent evidence uh, uh, that walking can both prevent and treat depression. Now, of course, one of the issues is, is then, well, what are the, is the quality of those studies? So, for example, the, um, the, the Ruth Jetson review on treating depression with walking only had eight studies in, and they were quite small. And when you look at the, the demographics of the included participants, you realize that that is evidence that's, that's quite specific to older um, older women, you know, not necessarily generalizable across whole population. So the systematic review level evidence still is, 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 is relatively limited in scope, but it is there. And then what we've got for the, for the other outcomes is the, the evidence we found, or the studies we found, broken down by cross-sectional studies, associations, uh, prospective cohort studies, um, looking for longitudinal uh, relationships, single bout or acute studies, um, and sometimes they would be kind of uh, a within subject design. So um, you know, on day one, someone did some yoga and measured their mental well-being, and then they came back a week later and did a walk and did the same scale. Was there a difference? Um, and sometimes they were just um, between group. Um, you know, randomization was kind of rare between them, that sort of thing. And then we defined intervention uh, as anything longer than four weeks. So studies that had done a four week at least walking program to try and impact mental health. Anxiety was really the only outcome where the evidence was consistent and um, uh, of, of good enough quality, of, of, of good enough, of the right nature to say again that we, we, we think walking has a preventive and a treatment effect on anxiety type conditions. Um, state Trait Anxiety Index, STAI, I think was the most commonly used in those studies. However, when we get to self-esteem, psychological stress, psychological well-being, and subjective well-being, um, there were fewer studies. And when studies did exist, they were, they were not consistent. Some would find 
no effect, others would find an effect. Some would find a negative, um, non-significant effect. So not really much we can say at a, though for those outcomes in terms of strong conclusions. There's some promising evidence that's indicative of, of a positive effect, but of course we might be subject to publication bias, publication bias there. Um, and the, uh, like I say, the, the number of studies and the size of them was, was not yet what we would call a, a convincing evidence base. Prospective studies, really missing, um, especially for, for self-esteem and psychological stress. So I think a clear evidence uh, gap there or a search priority, if, if you know of longitudinal data that could answer those questions, um, the, the gap is there. They aren't, they aren't currently, currently well known. For resilience, we were surprised that there was absolutely no evidence. Um, no studies have had addressed the question of walking and, uh, and that particular mental health outcome, which surprised us. Um, and for social isolation and loneliness, that was quite a, an unusual evidence base because um, there was kind of work to, the, the intervention was using social connection to try and increase walking. It was almost like it was see, that was seen as, a, as an antecedent rather than a, an outcome of walking. So it was an unusual evidence base and um, one where uh, effectively the conclusion was a lot more work is needed. Um, that's how we presented it in a table, and, and again with the scoping review, unlike a systematic review, we, you know, we don't do a sort of pooled effect, and, and we don't sort of do a, a judgment of, of study quality. So we kind of come up with these sort of subjective st statements, like um, you know, limited but emerging evidence, um, emerging evidence, um, of course for, for resilience, no evidence. But depression and anxiety, I think, were the outcomes where, from the scoping review, we can say, you know walking is, is, is having a positive effect here. Um, and then, like I say, for resilience. No evidence. Okay. Uh, sorry, yes? Sorry, are we allowed to? Yeah, please, yes, please. Cool. Um, I was just wondering, for the observational evidence, mm -hmm. I presume most of that is based on self-reported walking measures. A hundred percent of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So has there been any research into differences in terms of validity between with and without uh, such? There has for overall physical activity measures. It's, it's the work by Simon Rosenbaum from, from New South Wales. And so I think does they, mental health impact on validity? I believe they concluded that it does, yeah. yeah. Um, and, but I haven't seen anything specifically for walking. Yeah, and I measures. presume in most of those studies there were some ways of trying to deal with reverse causality issues? Well, I mean, obviously, n not in the, um, the cross-sectional evidence, but where prospective evidence existed, yes, the attempts were made you know, to exclude cases at um, baseline um, and, and for a given uh, follow-up, a washout period before yeah. events were monitored. Now, it, it's something that um, Leandro and, and the team on the systematic review, I think, are going to have to consider for the mental health outcomes, is that <laughs> Um, this is a sort of sweeping statement, but I, th I think it's worth thinking about. With something like cardiovascular disease or diabetes or, or the kind of classic physiological disease outcomes, they sort of they occur and then they sort of maintain until a given endpoint. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's, it, I would, uh, my hypothesis would be that in the mental health, for conditions like anxiety or depression, they can occur and then uh, not go away, but but no longer have clinical depression, and then and then you know can sort of pick up throughout the life course over a 10-year period. So from that point of view, how effective the traditional approach of having a washout period and excluding a baseline is, I don't know. I think that's something that the, the, the systematic review team and, and will have to consider how to, how to deal with, with the kind of recurring nature of some certain mental health outcomes. No worries. Is there anything else on, on, on that? Jenna? Well, while we're on that, um, um, I was interested in your statement about um, some that the walking may appear to have some kind of positive effect on some of these outcomes that you listed, and I wondered how you kind of came to that, kind of given that most of those are cross-sectional studies and with quite severe limitations in terms of generalizability and internal validity. So I guess it kind of moves on from cats, just really coming up with those statements that appear on the next table about effect or potential. I think. I think you say effectiveness or effect, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I might say potential. Yeah, um, I would 100% take that comment on board. Um, 
it was something that we tried to get the language that, that was defensible and mm -hmm. similar to something James and I have been talking about on, on, a, on the walking and cycling stuff. You know, there wasn't a kind of grade type assessment of the strength of the evidence or anything like that. Uh, with the scoping review, you know, we were sort of aiming to say what had what were the papers themselves say, and so it, it was more a case of well, the, there have been five papers that have reported that they believe there's a, a, a positive effect or a, a positive association here. But yeah, I would take I would very much take these with a pinch of salt, and I, I'll talk about this a bit um, towards the end. That with with the scoping review, our aim wasn't to come to conclusions. It was to say well. What has been done since 1997, and can we start to highlight the priorities to do the high quality perspective type analyses, interventions, etc.? So, yeah, would 100% agree with you. Yeah, point. no, I was, I was reading the second line thinking, hmm, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is me. Oh, no, go Sorry. on. No, of course. I'm not scientific uh, or a scientist. Yeah. Um, I'm just, is it seasonal? Is that taken? consideration at all because obviously if you're walking with this nice sunshine for a day it makes you feel generally better anyway than it is if it's a very cloudy and damp day. Um sorry I don't mean name. Uh, Deborah. Deborah. You have very elegantly moved us on to the next point. Oh, and I, <laughs> no, no, thank you. Um, Good plant. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, excellent question. So let's explore that. So this is me walking my dog on a clear but not sunny day on, on uh, Braid Hills um, in South Edinburgh. What I'd like you to do, or I'm going to invite you to do, again, is talking to the person next to you, what effects do you think that walk is having on my mental health? Off you go. Yours on the dog. <laughs> Up to you, Nick. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. He's doing this out of choice. So we've got the, the, the view and the natural environment, let's say, and we've got the, the weather, so to, to Deborah's point, it wasn't a lovely sunny day, but if you and I quite enjoy uh, a winter's sea, um, so that was good, that, that made me cheerful. And then the, the presence of my dog. Um, so none of those things are anything to do with the physiology of walking. So walking has become a kind of delivery mechanism for other things that benefit my mental health. Is that fair? Good. What else did people talk about? We, we assumed because it is light and you're outside and it's winter, ego, it must be a weekend. Because during, <laughs> during the weekend, you don't go out during the week. 
during the daytime, and it's dark when you come home from work. So ergo, it's collinear with it being a weekend. You just might be chipper at the weekend. <laughs> on the weekend. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was a Saturday. There you go. Um, so good, good production. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was generally in a better mood on a Saturday afternoon than yeah. a Monday afternoon. <laughs> So yeah, definitely, that's part of it. But See, we thought it depends a lot about your existing mental health, because it could be you're in a good mood, you have the weekend, you're playing a dog, or you know, you've got loads of stuff to do, you've got work to do, you still want to take the dog out for a walk, you know, it's stressful. It completely depends on what your mental state is to start with. Okay, so there's a couple of things going on there. There's what is my, the, the journey, or not the journey, but how, how have I, what, what, what state have I got there in? You know, so if I'm feeling rushed or anxious about something else, this might just become another chore that compounds on some of that anxiety. But if, if when Nick says, it's a Saturday afternoon, you know, I'm relaxing, there's someone who there with me who took the, took the photo, so maybe I've got some social company, it, that could have a very different trajectory on, on, on my mental health, absolutely. So the state you're in when you start doing it and the other contextual factors around it will also start to impact on, is that, you know, improving indices of mental health, holding them level, or starting to, to have a negative impact. Excellent. What else? Um, we suggested that um, it looks like you're, you've had to walk up a hill, so you might have had some quite vigorous <laughs> exercise on the way up there, which might have released more endorphins or something. Excellent, okay, so the first mention of the, the physicality the, the physical dose of probably some relatively vigorous activity to climb a hill and, and be out doing, you know, what a, a walk that might be more strenuous than you know five minutes around the corner to the shops. So some physiological effect from walking up a hill. And of course, then there can also be um, psychological effects from you know the self-efficacy of, you know, I haven't walked up that hill before and I've made it to the top. You know, so there's multiple ways that climbing up a hill could impact mental health. Excellent. Was there anything else that people spoke about that hasn't come up yet? Just what you're going to do next. So, you know, on a cold day, you've prepared, you've got your coat on, you know, ruddy cheeks, you head home and either have a lovely hearty meal or go to a pub with whoever's with you. And do you know that there's kind of reward and self-care involved in the sequelae of, you know, this challenge, which is more than a walk on a pleasant day? Absolutely. So as well as what came before, what's coming afterwards, definitely. So the reason that I think that's really interesting to explore is because I think, it's my, my proposition that the mechanisms by which walking may or may not impact mental health in a positive, neutral or negative way are quite complex. And I think there's a lot of them. And, as we discussed, is it about the, the intensity? Is it about the environment it takes me to? Is it about the company that it puts me with? Um, all these questions, for me, there's, I think it's, up, it's, a, it's worth asking, are there, is it a much more complex, with many more pathways um, kind of uh, system than, let's, you know, be controversial, the relatively simple pathway between aerobic exercise and cardiovascular outcomes, which are hard enough to understand as a population level. So if we're trying to understand walking mental health, then we have to start by saying this could be a lot harder than previous outcomes that, that we've worked hard to establish an evidence base for. Isn't that slightly unfair because mental health covers so many different things, whereas if you're saying cardiovascular is that's kind of one thing whereas mental health is all these different it's a fair point and I've got a slide I think in two slides which will speak to that yes okay I could say physical health mental health yeah. but even if we take one mental health outcome such as depression I think there's about nine different potential pathways by which physical activity can lead to better outcomes and then we've got all the different dimensions of walking and we don't know which one it is that might be delivering those different outcomes. One slide, depression. So, what, what, six, seven, eight, and six, so nine potential hypotheses by which a dose of 
physical activity, this isn't even walking, might lead to improvements in, 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 in depression. And we don't know, is, you know which of those pathways is it, which combination, what weighting of the different of the combination, and what's the important thing to emphasize? Is it about doing walking that gives you social company for, for distraction, social interaction and distraction from negative thoughts? Is it about doing something strenuous enough up a hill that you get some sort of, I know the endorphin stuff is, is kind of, it's, it's slightly discredited now with its other um, chemicals in the body rather than endorphins, but you know, is it about the in intensity that creates the, the physiological response that gives me the mental health benefits? And the reason I think that's really important is in terms of promoting physical activity what is it we need, uh, on walking in particular, what is it we need to promote? Is it that we need to promote um, an intensity message about pace? Or is it that we need to promote uh, a social message? Doesn't matter how fast you do it with, but do it with someone. Is it that we have to promote the environment message? Is it that if we all went up that hill in Edinburgh, we'd experience different responses to the environment, the dog, the company, the intensity, and actually, the, you know, this is population science. There isn't a single response that's uniform across the population. So I think, while 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 your point about physical health is totally fair, I I at the moment would argue that understanding the way walking impacts mental health is much more complex than the physical outcomes that we've established. Sorry, um, uh, do you compare, say, for instance, walking in Edinburgh, like you've shown? against somebody walking in uh, inner city Glasgow um, as a comparison because I think the environment is actually quite important for mental health. I haven't, but I would 100% agree that it, it, it needs to be understood. And of course, what's the reasons, you know, the reasons that allow me to be walking up a hill on a Saturday afternoon with my dog might be quite different to the reasons that the other person is walking in an urban environment in inner city Glasgow. Is that something to do with social stratification? Is that because they have to be at work that's causing them, you know, more stress? Is there something about, you know, James and I spoke about this, about the, the concrete or the emissions about the inner city Glasgow walking that is differential to the hill in Edinburgh? Um, and it could be that there's positive differences and there are some areas of cities which are lovely to walk in. You know, this, this is a really nice city to be walking in. Um, and there are other areas that are kind of scary and um, can induce, you know, stress, um, that sort of thing. And, you know, traffic-related dangers, which could be perceived differently by age and all that sort of thing. So, um, it, I think understanding this stuff could be really beneficial when it comes to knowing what to promote if we want to improve mental health. Paul, yes. Is this evidence based mainly from high-income settings, <sighs> like high-income countries? I guess is what I'm asking. Um, the stuff in the scoping review. Yes, all, I, 80, 90 percent of it off the top of my head was from high income countries um, and similar percentage was from middle to um, sort of late middle age adults. So the generalizability to, for example, children or other settings, and we, we don't have the evidence base for. And the scope review isn't set up to answer that question, it's set up to highlight that we don't currently know. Do you think that the mechanisms might be quite different? Yes, I do. Because it seems that this idea of choice is kind of a critical one for lower income settings. Like people walk because they don't have a car and it's the only way to get around. Sometimes quite long distances. Yeah, 100%. And uh, I, I would totally highlight that as a, a gap that needs understanding. But one that we don't have an evidence, I wouldn't say based on the scope of view, we have any evidence to, to make any conclusions on. Um, similar sort of thing, this is just um, one of the parts, this is uh, David Lubens um, from Newcastle, um, in children, again showing that neurobi neurobiological, psychosocial and behavioural hypotheses for how physical activity can improve mental health outcomes, um, with the behavioural ones being things like improvement in um, sleep quality or, or coping skills. So lots and lots of potential mechanisms by which a given dose of physical activity may or may not impact a range of mental health outcomes. So, 
question is, and I, and, I, and I don't have any answers, I'm just the question at this stage and really interested in kind of your feedback and responses to this, is how does, if it does, an understanding of mechanisms help us promote um, physical activity, brackets walking, and do we have to start asking questions like our type and quality of walking, the more relevant factors if we're looking to impact um, mental health? I'm not saying they are, but I think it's a question that's been identified from the scope of it. Because as well as having a very tight range of um, high income countries and age groups, the sort of walking in those 55 studies and five reviews was massively variable in terms of dose, duration, intensity, frequency, etc. And the sort of second idea that I wanted to present to you guys today and, and sort of stimulate some discussion around is a related one around people's motives for walking. So if we compare me on that hill on a Saturday afternoon walking my dog, what do you think this gentleman's motives, and let's say that this is in central Glasgow where it rains occasionally, <laughs> what do you think his motives for walking might be? Going home from the pub. Get home from the pub? Because <laughs> he can't drive? Yeah in the pub. Good, so maybe he, ha he, he has to, so an element of choice has been taken away. Maybe being in the pub was brilliant for his mental health, I guess it <laughs> depends what he did when he was there, if his football team won or whatever Just it might be. his waterproof shoes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Why else might this, this gentleman be doing this walk? Going to get medication for his sick wife. Excellent, yep. You know, so that's going to be a pretty stressful event, I, I would have thought. He hasn't got any other option. No other option, so there's that choice doesn't exist. He hasn't chosen to go for a lovely weekend walk. Maybe for so, for, by social stratification, or because of parking regulations, or because of a number of factors, he has to walk. So that might be having a different impact on his mental health than the picture of me at the hill. What else? Get to work, I think you got that one. Parking expensive, difficult. Car's broken, can't, hard, can't afford a hard car or can't get a replacement. Um, has chosen to because he's had a stressful day and he knows that walking is good for alleviating his personal stress. Or to next point, maybe he's been in a pub and, uh, walk, and driving is no longer an option. So in any given walk, be it me on a hill or this gentleman or in other countries and other settings across the age ranges for healthcare reasons, there's a ton of reasons why we might walk. So as well as understanding the mechanisms, I think it's really going to be important to understand the reasons, because I think they're going to be intertwined. The reason someone's walking can have a big impact on the mental health outcomes that we might see later on. You might not have heard of this company, <laughs> but they're quite good at impacting and sustaining population level behaviours. And they've chosen to focus on happiness to stimulate the behavior they want. So when we start talking about people's motivations, is it that instead of talking about um, negatives, negative consequences of not doing what we tell you, that we could learn something from um, companies that have spent a lot more money than we have on marketing and understanding human behavior and focusing on some of the positives now, to do that, and to do it credibly, we would need the evidence base. You know, we can't just start saying walking makes us happy, um, and you know, we could undermine our own case if we don't have good evidence to support that. So as well as understanding the mechanisms and the motivations, is there something about the ultimate outcomes that could speak to those motivations? And of course, when we look at the physical activity guidelines, um, adult strength eight, eight active daily, 150 minutes, moderate intensity. You know, so I'm not seeing any of that stuff of kind of around quality or type. Um, I am seeing things around a kind of a dose, an intensity type recommendation. Um, example: the only one that you have there in the in the physical activity recommendations is brisk walking. You know, so is that missing all this information about? mechanisms about what walking delivers, about understanding people's motivations. And these are the things in, the, in, that, in that guidance as well that, that are focused on. Reduces risk of diabetes, coronary heart disease, stroke, 
helps maintain a healthy weight, helps maintain ability to perform tasks, improves self-esteem. It's probably the one that's closest to a, a positive outcome. Um, reduces symptoms of depression and anxiety. If Coca-Cola was trying to sell walking or physical activity, do you think they'd do it that way? You know, so when we're trying to promote this stuff, how can, how can this evidence base help us do that? James. Uh, if you just jump back up the slide, then do this one. Yeah, I mean, they are to an extent, though, in the imaging they use. So I, I think the imaging used in these documents is an important part of even the message that's not in the words. Totally. Um, and what I don't think I, we, or I know or we know is, you know, to what extent is this stuff coming through? So we know from the Scottish Health Survey that I think it was about 5% of adults in Scotland could repeat the 150 minute message, let alone the rest of the guidelines. But do they know, if we act, should we be asking about this stuff? You know, if we are, do they have a much better knowledge of the benefits of being active? I think it's a really good point. So this is the proto model. Um, it doesn't have any arrows yet, but this is kind of what I'd like to do is bring some of this stuff together, these sort of these different ideas. So is there something about, if we can understand the mechanisms, does that help us with the promotion of the type and quality of activity, brackets walking, that we're trying to promote to improve physical activity levels? And if we can understand the different mental health outcomes, can we intertwine that with their motives for taking those messages on board and, and promoting physical activity? So, these are kind of the two main ideas that have emerged from the scoping review and uh, would be really interested in, in ongoing discussion about, you know, is there anything in here that could help us promote physical activity at a population level? The scoping review, we, we kind of um, organised some of this stuff in, in this kind of uh, I don't know, framework, if you like, or hexagonal diagram um, about the, the research priorities or the unknowns, the evidence gaps that we highlighted in the review. So there's gaps around the context of walking. Is it about green and urban environments? Is that, is that one of the critical things? What are the differential effects? And what does that mean for people who don't have access to green spaces or, or, or green environments, blue spaces to walk in? Is it about the social aspect? And is it about the, the type of walking and the reason? Is it by choice or necessity? Walking dose, I think that, that's relatively self-explanatory, but, but which of these um, dimensions are the critical ones, or which combination um, for, for delivering those positive outcomes, if any? Or are we in a kind of, everyone's different, some is better than none, and, and people will experience differential effects? You know, or do we say 150 minutes per week of brisk walking will put off people who may have been amenable to a message around social interaction? And quality. Um, there's a lot of study design issues. A lot of the studies were very much feasibility, the ones we identified, the 55, uh, you know, kind of like say with, with um, limited designs in, in, in terms of the way they were set up and, and very short term, term measurements. Um, lots of studies in, that came from a sort of mindfulness field, so quite different literature to what we traditionally would look at in, in terms of physical activity. Um, We've spoken about this, but are the effects different by demographic? And then, um, you know, kind of key concepts in, in, in terms of the literature for walking and, and mental health. You know, should we be focusing on the negative stuff, preventing negatives? Should we be focusing on the promotion of positives? So, you know, um, psychologists will tell us that, um, you know, lack of depression doesn't imply happiness and well-being. Those are different dimensions in, in terms of how we talk about psychology. But, you know, does it, does it become nonsensical to only look at a given outcome such as anxiety? And, you know, should mental health be considered in a more holistic way? Sort of, I guess now just when we say about all physical health, you know, do these things, once you've controlled for and adjusted for baseline events and stuff like that, you know, do you have so few cases of um, a lack of psychological well-being um, the, the, the science becomes, you know, restrictive and, and too difficult to do. We did an infographic um, for the for the paper, um, which uh, is available, and, and, and really this summarises um, the, the the scoping review. 
1997, the area had been surprisingly little study, but um, that's what Morris and Harman found. There has been a growth in the evidence base over the 21 years. Apologize for, for the wording, Jenna, but we've said there was strong evidence, systematic review evidence, um, for, for, for depression and anxiety of the outcomes we looked at. Um, may improve positive outcomes, such as happiness and self-esteem, but you know, limited evidence base. And emerging evidence that there's something different if you do the walking outdoors in a natural environment compared to doing it indoors on a treadmill or potentially some studies um, in, in, in urban type environments. Um, those are the infographics for the other papers. Um, and, and like I said, Justin, will, will, I think we'll make these slides available to everyone if, if you want to look into any of those. Um, so that's cardiovascular disease and mortality, Peperoia, social um, walking roof hunter, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. I think that's uh, Man sorry, that's, so that's Manos, Manos Nantakis, that's Peperoia. Um, how fast is fast enough? Katrina Chita Walk, uh, residential relocation, Noah D. Ding, mental health, that was us, and Charlie Foster, um, population approaches to growth and physical activity. So it's all in there if, if you want to look at any of those other papers in the uh, special, special edition. Okay, concluding remarks. So, 21 years it, it took us to, uh, or, or that was the spread of time we looked at for the scoping review. Um, but of course, I was reminded when going back through my files that we'd actually tried to do this in 2008. Um, that was when we first attempted to update Walking to Health in um, 1997. Um, so it was, a, it was a slightly sombering moment to realize that this, this took a really long time to finish. Um, this was the first meeting of, of the authorship team um, in, at Sparkhole 2008. I don't know if anyone in the room was, was attending that conference. But actually, we've decided that it's a positive message, that if you do have those unfinished papers somewhere in, in, a, in a folder or a, or a hard drive, even 10 years later, um, it's possible to get them over the line. So, what didn't we look at? We didn't look at neurological health, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, and dementia. Massive burden that they have on um, health and social care. Somewhere, neurological health is classified as different to mental health in, in by the, the WHO and the ICD. Um, I, I guess it has both mental and psychosocial and pathophysiological pathways, so it might be somewhere between the two the two areas. I think there are a number of systematic reviews that um, could be done from the scope review, specifically on anxiety. There's, there's no systematic reviews on that and walking. There are gaps around prospective analyses. So if you have access to long, good longitudinal data with these outcomes and these exposures, then, then I think the scoping review shows that there's, there's room to, to try and put those out there. Um, and then clearly, um, we <coughs> hope that the scoping review will, will be a, a starting point for this work around how can we, can, how can we and can we promote mental health at uh, a population level through walking. That's the, what he said that. So, in 1997, pleasure group, um, surprisingly little study. And in 2018, we concluded that despite the growth in evidence base, given the importance of mental health and the evidence gaps identified, uh, we think that the statement that Morrison Harvey made in 1997 still holds true. I think we've kind of covered that, so, Thank you for your attention, and uh, any questions? Nick. I have a, a comment and a, a question. So the comment is that uh, you, you had a throwaway line about um, the, the, the difficulty of epidemiological studies when you're dealing with an outcome is effectively waxing and waning, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. mental health. Actually, that is true of all sorts of things. It's true of, it's true of diabetes. Yeah. And unfortunately, in Epi, we force, you know, everything into a paradigm of you start with people who haven't got it, and then you study the people till they get the first occurrence of it because you want to study incidents. And we have to move beyond that and find some clever way of having prospective studies that allow for things that wax and wane. Mm -hmm. um, that's the comment, and I don't, I, that really pertains to this. So. Then the question is, 
I, I'm not quite sure that I understand whether you're taking a linear approach to what is the evidence and ergo what should the recommendation be. Or you're starting from a statement of belief that we should be promoting walking and then you're trying to fill in the gaps. I think or is it about filling in the gaps with a view to being clear about public health messaging? So I wasn't quite sure what you're trying to do. <laughs> Sorry, I wonder if I am. Okay, so I think to the first point, totally agree. That it, it, I think waxing and waning is, is a better way of putting it than I did, and it well, makes it a challenging epidemiological um, investigation. And, and, and allied to that, and I, I suspect this, this statement is not entirely fair, but maybe we can take certain physiological outcomes, such as diabetes or cancer or cardiovascular disease, it, it's a relatively linear progression from um, a state of good health to, you know, with, with some, a bumpy road to the outcome be a disease endpoint. And I think we impose that. Maybe we do impose that. I'm not sure that's necessarily true. With, with, with the depression, and, and it came up because of uh, with Leandro's um, systematic review of meta-analysis that's, that's underway, when, if, you, if you're doing prospective work in mental health, at what age should you start? You know, because um, if we start, you know, everyone at baseline was age 30, well, what's happened to that point that could have affected their given mental health? And if we take the traditional approach of excluding everyone who's ever had a diagnosis of depression, we're going to exclude a lot of people. And I wonder, and the sort of point I made when we we're doing the protocol is, will we come up with in, inappropriate conclusions about the, the relative and absolute risk, um, and therefore conclude that, well, it has a much bigger effect on coronary heart disease than it does on depression. So I don't know the answer to those, but it, I certainly agree that we need clever epidemiological approaches to, to try and address them. Um, to the second, second point, I think we can say that we should be promoting walking. I, I believe that promoting walking is better than doing nothing, given the evidence that we have. But I do believe it's important to fill in the gaps around how can we promote it better, and how can we understand the types of walking that could be promoted, and how can we understand how to speak to people's motivations to try and engage with, with that behavior. So if, if I was being you know, if you took the analogy of cigarette smoking, we know enough to um, you know, to get on and think about messaging and how we prevent it. Does is that predicated on really understanding the pathophysiological mechanisms that give rise to the adverse effects of smoking? You could argue not. I, I don't know the smoking literature well. They're ahead. What they're about fifty years ahead of us in terms yeah. of activity. It was a rhetorical question. Yeah. No, I, 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 I think it's a really important one to ask, and where it comes from is I'm on the Communication and Surveillance Committee for the 2018 update of the CMO guidelines, and we were asked these questions, you know, how should we message physical activity, and it just occurred to me we shouldn't be saying 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous or 75 minutes of vigorous in bouts or at least 10 minutes. I, I, I don't think that's, you know, 5% of people in Scotland could even re repeat that. So it, it, it's more a challenge you know, how, how can we learn to do it better? I don't know the answer yet. No, I, th I absolutely agree with you. It's about how, how you better articulate the message. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. yeah. Slightly different question. Please? Sorry, I was just on that point, I was thinking if you compare like Coke yep. with cigarette packets, like Coke is all open happiness, cigarette packets are like, here's a diseased tongue. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, both of those approaches seem to work, right? Yes, and I am not an expert in the history or the sociology of health promotion, um, although I do give a lecture on it to medical students, which amuses them, because we look at the um, HIV promotion that was done in the 80s, which was entirely fear-based. We look at um, drink driving campaigns and seatbelt campaigns, which are largely, here is a terrible thing that will happen to you if you don't do what we say. Um, and those are all kind of s sort of stop doing type behaviors, are debatable on the, uh, the seat, I suppose. But then we, you know, physical activity is a please start doing or please, please keep doing type message. And it seems to me that in, in the marketing space, there's a lot of positivity around, you know, look what you could have if only you would engage in this behavior. 
you know, look at the utility you could have, look at the lifestyle, look at the person you could be if, if you opened a can of Coke or, or something. So I suspect that a combination of um, positivity and also, um, you know, kind of fear-based um, messaging is need, needs to be tried. Yeah, I get the tension being that Coke doesn't need any evidence to show like a lady in a bikini and suggest that you're going to be as sexy as she is or whatever, but only you drink that Coke. So no, I mean the only evidence the thing, I they need is if showing it does it improve the you know they and like say their, their marketing budget far exceeds our public health budget and and they've established that doing this gets people to do the behaviour. Now, if we take the point that we believe that physical activity improves health. Question then becomes: What evidence do we need to, to try and do that better? To try and make that promotion better? Yeah, I know. I, mean, I think that's one side of it. But then I think the other side that you're bringing out is that the types of physical activity may have different impacts on mental health. So it, you've got a slightly complex relationship in which the marketing is related to the outcome because you're saying we're walking, you know, in certain groups or something might have a differential effect, and that is where our understanding is weakest. I mean, to say that we could use whatever kind of you know, um, imaging is helpful to promoting the physical ac ac activity because we know the physical activity has good outcomes in the general, yes, fine. But then it's like, well, are we trying to promote it in specific ways because we think walking faster or walking in groups or walking in green space or something has different outcomes and then p perhaps very specific outcomes that could only be used or more prominently be used for those specific types of activity. 100% agree. And one of the things we've done in the, the communication work is we've, we've started to speak to the professors of social marketing. And they do two things that they're amazed we don't do. They do market segmentation. That doesn't mean men and women in 10 year age groups. It, it means um, by demographic and by choice and by preference, what information do people respond to? And you know, at the moment, we have the same message for a 20-year-old undergraduate as for a 63-year-old office worker. That, that might not be the most effective public health message. The other thing they do is they've got the, the four Ps, and I, if I can remember them, product, place, promotion, and price. And we sort of do product, promotion, and place in physical activity. We never ever talk about price. What is the cost to the person to do the thing we're asking? And if you are in marketing, you always think about what's the co what is the person having to give up to do the thing I'm asking? We don't, and it, it's often time in physical activity. It might be effort. It might be time, you know, an opportunity cost away from work or family or you know. So, how can we start to use that? that level of understanding the price to, to promote physical activity in a more effective way? I don't know, but that's the questions we're starting to ask. And, and the scoping review was, you know, kind of help, helped us come up with trying to formulate at least what these questions might be. So, uh, in your title uh, included Walking in Sunshine. So, has there been a research uh, effect of walking on their mental health the reason why I'm asking is, uh, you know, same exercise. For example, my uh, my mother-in-law has a diabetes, mm -hmm. and my father-in-law always force her, uh, her to uh, go 18 hall of golfing. Uh, my wife, I mean, my uh, mother-in-law hates that. So actually, one day he uh, she brought the uh, uh, glucometer uh, with her, uh, and then uh, she measured the uh, glucose, and actually glucose level went, you know, higher. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, after 19 hall, uh, 18 hall. So uh, you know, try to use it as, as an excuse, not going for 18 hall, but then just go for 9 hall. Totally. No, then they say that the best way to ruin a good walk is to, you know, play around the golf or something. I, I apologise to anyone who enjoys it. And, he, and I, I, I know people who claim to be far more stressed at the end of a bad round than, you yeah. know, something else. I don't know of any research that has compared walking in good weather to walking in poor weather. Uh, it seems intuitive to me that the response might be different. I think the science will be made challenging by the fact that weather is also a determinant of, of behavior. So the more ecologically valid your study, the more that you're looking at sort of a complex kind of um, causal pathway um, or, or interrelated pathway. Um, I do know that Andy Jones, about a year, six months ago, showed that people who walked 
have a dog are far more likely to walk in poor weather, and that might be the explanation for their overall higher physical activity levels. So it might be about finding ways to overcome the impact of the weather, such as saying you're going to play golf or saying you're going to walk your dog. Walk in sunshine have an impact with vitamin D? Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Great point. Um, yes, and I, I don't know if, it, if there's any sort of medics in here know is vitamin D related to mental health? Is it's it related, related to absolutely everything. So yeah, I mean, that's cool. Um, and we, was it about north of about Watford? There isn't enough, there isn't enough. vitamin D. <laughs> so yeah, no, gr yeah, good point. I hadn't thought of that. Getting to half past, shall we? Is that point? Seems like a good time. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks, Paul. That was really good. Great, great to have people, you know, interacting, discussing. Totally. And, and if people want to get in touch, you know, there, there's my contact details. Happy to keep the conversation going. And if people do want to do further work on walking and mental health, I, you know, be really happy to have that discussion too. Thank you. Thanks.